Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, boy, I sound awfully important, don't I? Uh, believe me, I'm not. I'm just a very grateful alcoholic. Hi, my name's Gail, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is May 13th, 1978, and I guess I was pretty blessed to get sober in Akron, Ohio. Um, fell in love with uh, our program, and I'm here today. And uh, it was Nell Wing. I mentioned it to you last night that uh, I was so grateful when I was hosting her, and I said, Nell, if there's ever anything I can do for you, she said, uh, I said, just ask. Well, be careful when you say that in Alcoholics Anonymous, because you just might end up being an archivist. <laughs> and um, I'd like to tay, um, share some of my uh, experience with, when the, we did the first couple ones on this, we, we had a code of ethics that we borrowed from the Society of American Archivists. And um, ethics and morals can be very, very important uh, when we handle our materials and how we conduct our business. So um, I'm going to combine that as well with um, the ethics that govern us in archives. And I don't know. I know what's wrong here. If I get this mic if I get this battery right, I'll be able to use this device. Let me switch it and see if it works. Yep. I think it's going to work. Yep. There we go. All right, that's better. So, uh, you know, I come from Akron. I got uh, I cut my teeth on the four absolutes. Is what I'm about to think say or do right or wrong, true or false, ugly or beautiful, and how does it affect the other guy and Really, those four absolutes kind of end up being ethics and morals to guide us as well in our archives work. Because well, we need to know wrong from right. And as public servants, we try to draw a line between right and wrong acts, differentiating between those that contribute to the common welfare and those that detract from the common welfare of AA. I see, I, do I hear an amen? I heard some moaning out there. So <laughs> I think we're off to a good start. So we put on our white hats and we stand watch over that line. And it's not always that simple, though. Sometimes the line shifts. Sometimes you lose sight of where the line is, and sometimes forces beyond our control push us across that line. You're nodding your head, too, right? So we can use a code of ethics to help us to find our way to the right side of that boundary. You know, boundaries are kind of important, aren't they? You know, and you're going to hear a lot about that when we talk about scope and some of the things that we talk about when it comes to archives. Sometimes it looks like some of us are on self will run riot, you know? So it kind of keeps us a little bit in check. It's a branch of philosophy dealing with what is morally right and morally wrong. And a code of ethics would be a written set of guidelines issued by an organization to its workers and management to help them conduct their actions in accordance with its primary values and ethical standards. The rules of behavior based on ideas about what is morally good and bad. Now, it seems to me there's two sets, and they're very, very similar. If you go to the Society of American Archivists, they'll tell you about a code of values and a code of ethics. There's like two different sets of principles. And they kind of blend together. I'll just sort of introduce you to the first one that kind of has to do with our roles as an archivist. I mean, we spin a lot of plates. We have, you know, it's, it's really a full-time job. It's definitely a labor of love. You know, you have your role, you have to select, acquisition, you have to arrange and describe, you have to have access, preservation, outreach, you know, um, on and on and on. We have so many responsibilities. And the values that go with that is a sense of purpose. Accountability, we have to be transparent, somewhat democratic. Preservation, <laughs> um, we have a moral obligation to society to do that. We have to be professional about that. That's where the ethics and values come in. We have, uh, we have to be good stewards of our uh, holdings. And we have to have a scope and a retention plan. We have to know when we should scan something, when we should keep something, when we should deaccession something. And uh, we have to provide a policy around access and use. And we have a social responsibility. We need to be in service to our area, to our district, to our intergroup office. That's basically the values that we carry. So in AA, the purpose is to preserve the AA message and carry it to other alcoholics. To preserve the history of our fellowship to prevent distortion. You know, and if we ever get lost, those of us that are keeping these records will provide a way to get back to the basics, right? You know, we have a way back to cooperate 
with and support other AA archives and archivists working within AA service structure and the 12 traditions. The idea of preventing distortion is for what we strive. And this is what we're doing here this weekend, aren't we? We're sharing and we're cooperating with one another. We have to be consistent with AA's primary purpose of maintaining our sobriety and helping other alcoholics achieve recovery. And the archives of Alcoholics Anonymous will do that through cooperation, collaboration, and respect. Other archives and archivists. You've already probably, some of you, been to the preservation workshop, which we deal with here, which is a definite part of our responsibilities. Because, you know, paper dies. You know, if we don't learn how to handle it, how to care for it, it won't be around for the next generations. Um, so some of those principles really help us to do that. We preserve such primary sources to enable us to better comprehend the past, understand the present, and prepare for the future. You know, hopefully some of your archives will help um, your delegates and your other service members do a little research so that they're well informed before they go off to the conferences. I mean, it can be not just for, you know, archives. It can be widespread in helping us carry the group conscience as well. Accountability is important. Uh, taking an inventory of your collections and your holdings is important. And then also coming up with a way to retrieve that information. As your archives grows and gets bigger and bigger, sometimes it's hard to remember which box you put what in or which file, right? So you want to have a, a possible way to get back to that. Uh, we call those finding aids. Come up with some kind of a system where you can locate your materials. Um, in the manual um, that we have for, the work, uh, for archives, um, it's quite detailed in how to provide ownership. You have to be clear on what is your property, um, whether you have policy on accepting something on loan or not. And uh, we'll get into a little more of um, that can get kind of complicated, so you have to keep very, very good records. You must be diligent at disposing of records as retaining them, and that's kind of scary, isn't it? I know those of you that are new, I had a girl already come up to me and ask, well, how do I know what to do with all this? How do I know what to keep and what to dispose of? I don't think you learn that your first couple days with that responsibility as archivist. I think that comes in time. But please, get names of people that have gone before you and field some of those questions to some of us that have dealt with this and will help you to um, make your policy on that. You can't possibly know it if you're, if you're newly rotated into this position. Um, but there are some things that you can certainly scan. And another thing, when it comes to insurance on an archive, we don't insure. We ha this is all considered spiritual property to us. If you're on the AA side of collecting archives and caring for your archives, it's spiritual property to us. And so it's real important when you go to, that you back some of your stuff up. If you can do that through scanning um, and through an, uh, any backup that you can do is a really good form of preservation in itself. So um, some of the ways you might guide uh, whether you deaccession or not is the item, if it's not relevant to Alcoholics Anonymous, or to the archive's mission and purpose. So getting back to the purpose, it's really important that you get with your committee and you have a scope on what you're going to collect or how will you know what to accept or what to reject. That is, should be your first step. If there's no scope to your collection, oh my God, you probably missed the primary purpose. I've seen that happen where we got so excited about so many objects that we forgot what our purpose was. And you can miss what you're supposed to be doing for your area or district. Uh, the item would be more appropriately housed in a different archival repository. Oftentimes when I come here, if we have documents, for example, um, a lot of Nell Wing's talks were sent to me. Well, we don't need all of Nell Wing's talks. We saw that some of those talks were given in different states in the United States, and we brought those talks to you, and we distributed them at past workshops. If you have something in your archives that might benefit another archives and doesn't fit into the scope of your collection, please bring it to an event like this and see if you can find a home for it where that information is relevant, if it's outside of your scope. Um, maybe the item has deteriorated beyond usefulness. Maybe it's made of hazardous material or is actively decomposing. 
Uh, perhaps it's got black mold on it. You don't want to play with that for too long. You can get sick. So sometimes those things have to be let go of. Um, you each have um, an area. You might have a repository. You might not. That's going to limit the scope of your collection right there, depending on how much money does your area going to provide you to care for these things. That's going to factor into what you do. Uh, the items care and storage are far more expensive than the value of the object as it relates to the archive's mission and purpose. Does that make sense to you a little bit? I mean, the, if you've got a closet to work with, that's about all you're going to, if you have a low budget, you're not going to be able to care for a lot of things. So that will limit just how much you can accept. Perhaps the item may be replaced with a similar object of greater significance, quality, and better condition. Oh, also, sometimes archivists don't realize you don't need three copies of the same book. I remember saying that to someone, and they, believe it or not, it hadn't occurred to them. You know, you don't need a, a lot of copies of, a, of an item. And uh, the item is subject to legal and ethical standards requiring its removal. I don't know if that's pretty technical. All right, so now we're at the code of ethics. And that really just includes integrity, honesty, um, and some of the things we've already talked about. Judgment, um, I've already referred to that. That comes with experience. Archivists should exercise professional judgment in acquiring, appraising, and processing historical materials. Actually, this appraising we don't do. I'll get to that in just a minute. You're not, you know, have you ever had somebody come into your archives and say, how much do you want for that book? It's probably not an archivist. Um, or uh, how much does that cost? Uh, if that, you're probably gonna get that question if you're an archivist. Um, I just always say, how much, uh, how much would you sell your mother for? Um, <laughs> Um, I, I don't discuss that. Um, I'm proud to say that the Akron Archives, if you have a chance to visit, we've never had to buy, trade, or sell, or do anything. We've kind of put our faith and trust in God and these spiritual principles. And I know they work, because that's, that's how we did it. And um, they, uh, you don't have to go to that level. They should not allow personal beliefs or perspectives to affect their decisions. A lot of people have agendas. It's hard not to, isn't it? A lot of authors have agendas, archivists can have agendas, storytellers can have agendas. Our job is not to have an agenda. Our job is to collect the facts and to present the facts as they are. Um, so authenticity, archivists have a moral obligation to protect the integrity of records in the collection. That's probably one of the first things you'll do when you're given a collection is going to be to stabilize that collection and get control of that collection. If somebody brings you a, a box of items, check out the order of that. Don't start playing with the material until you see one pamphlet might connect to another pamphlet. There may be some intelligence in the way that is arranged. If you get a box of something, sit down and take inventory on that box immediate, immediate box immediately before you do anything. That's how you get control. Then take a look at your documents or whatever's in that box to see what might be you might need to stabilize. You might have, like, the paper clips are starting to oxidize. You might want to remove those. Uh, if something's real fragile, you might want to encapsulate that so that any handling will not damage it any further. Just general principles like that. Um, authenticity. <laughs> Don't alter, manipulate, destroy, or conceal facts or distort evidence. Now, you're laughing. You know what I think? Um, one of the most important things, I believe Nell shared this with me, is if, you know, there's argument whether we should keep original documents or not, I believe we should, because without an original document, if somebody got a hold of a document today with Photoshop and all the word processing things that we have, they could easily doctor or alter that document. And those of us that are archivists may have had some experience where we've seen documents get altered, because somebody's got an agenda. And they'll, they'll do that. So um, I believe we should keep them and keep them in good shape so that if we need to present an original document, we can. Security. One of the most essential steps is to ensure the safety of the materials placed in the archives. By the way, I've got to compliment the, uh, the committee here. There's always someone in that archives room watching over that room. If, you have an arch if you're an archivist and you're putting something on display, 
Don't leave your display if there's something of value on that display. Um, you have to keep it secure. You're responsible for the physical integrity of the material. You may consider special security locks on the front door or at a minimum on the file cabinets. It is important to remember that most of our collections are virtually irreplaceable. Uh, guard against accidental damage, vandalism, and theft, and have a disaster plan. <clears throat> we have a camera in the archives in Akron, and it says, if your program is not working, this camera is. <laughs> you protect all documentary materials for which they are, you're responsible and guard them against defacement, physical damage, deterioration, and theft, and I also suggest a fireproof cabinet if you can get one. That way um, you've added the security of fire. And it, you know there's lots of little things like don't store something on a bottom floor or a basement because actually water travels downwards, right? So you could um, have flood damage. So just simple, simple things to keep things safe. Now access, this is the part that's tough. Access. So now you've done the first stage, you've done the collecting. Now people want to use the documents. And policy on this is tricky. Um, access and use to promote and provide the widest possible access is your responsibility. But what about personal confidential information? What about sensitive information? What about if the local public wants some information on us? And what about anonymity, which we're going to get into? This gets a little tricky as to now that you've put stuff in files, who are you going to allow to see those files? And, uh, um, we should promote access to the fullest extent. Um, we have to have rules, though, about accessibility and ensure that the researchers adhere to them. If you were to look at private documents at the General Service Office, you wouldn't be able to bring your camera and snap a picture of it. They'd probably provide you with some access where you could write down what's going on, but they are... Um, keeping the documents safe, and, um, you know, we're just not going to go. I remember when I was, uh, one of these came to Akron. I think it was the third one. And one of the fellows came in, and he wanted us to take down everything that was on our wall so he could take it to Kinko's and copy it. <laughs> because a lot of AA says, hey, it's my archives. It belongs to me, too. And so I really suggest that your committee work with policy ahead of time so that you can point to policy and not have to react to things that might occur along the way. Um, privacy is important. Now, this, these are still just general archival principles. But we have a second set of standards that we have to follow. These are the you know, universal archival standards. But ours is even more when we get to anonymity. Um, it's actually sanctioned by law that we protect. Now, in the um, manual that we have, there's four categories, and I believe that started with Nell after she came back from the National Archives. Some of your files could be open to all. That means if the local grocery store wants to write an article or somebody in the community, that file would be open to all. But you might have another file that you would not share with the public, but you might share with AA members. <clears throat> this takes discernment. Another file you might open with approval, which means you might use your group conscience or your committee to decide just how much. And then some files, we don't have any like this. Uh, the General Service Office probably has more experience with more extensive and in-depth files, um, so we can often refer to Michelle for experience on this. But you may have some files that just wouldn't be pertinent to share at, the, at a certain time. Trust is a real important part of being an archivist. If your community doesn't trust you, you know, I remember when I started out as archivist at the office and they finally invited me in. Now it was with a small bar margin of a vote. I would suggest that you get a majority or a substantial majority. And I had been collecting, trying to do this for years, and I brought down the collection, and they were, they were worried that I might steal it. And it was funny, because I remember writing an article, what if I run off with all the stuff that I just gave them? Um, 
But in order for them to trust me, it's true, that's how that really. So in order for them to trust me, I did not put it on loan, which was a suggestion of my service sponsor at first, just to see how well they would handle the collection. I knew that if I wanted that trust, I had to wear one hat. And so that, uh, but I made sure that I took a nice inventory on that. I took inventory of their collection, what they had, and I took an inventory of what I was bringing in. And I kept good document records on that. But trust is real important. They've got to trust that you will care for it. And if you want donors to donate things, you have to get that respect and that trust too. Um, You should not take unfair advantage of their privileged access to and control of historical records and documentary materials. Hmm. So um, this guy's wearing two hats. You know, when an area decides to pick their archivist, you know what they do? They look for the local collector, and they make him the archivist. Because they don't know. Our job is to educate that there is a difference here. Now the guy's wearing two hats. You'd have to really be ethical. And I'm not saying that everyone who's wearing two hats is not ethical, but I think it's really challenging. If you're a collector and you're an AA archivist as well, I've seen a lot of people mistrust someone, even if they were being honest, just because of the two hats. Just because of the two hats. Archivists should not profit from any commercial exploitation of the records in their custody. Mm-hmm. I'm just briefly going to talk about copyright in case you don't go to the copyright uh, part of the segment of this because it's very, very important. You may have a, we have a letter, personal letter from Bill Wilson. It's wonderful. It's on depression. We actually own that letter. It was purchased by some friends of mine and donated to the archives because it was carried in the pocket of an old timer. But we don't have copyright on that letter. The letterhead owns the copyright on that letter. So some simple basics, if you're ever going to reproduce something or allow someone else to re reproduce it, you need to have some general understanding of copyright. Because um, that has to do with the law. It's illegal for anyone to violate any of the rights belonging to the owner of copyright. Some possible violations include photocopying or scanning, putting it online, uh, sharing or selling audio or video files, putting on public film exhibitions, or in most of the cases, you must have the written permission of the copyright owner. See, copyright doesn't mean you can't use it. Copyright just means you ought to ask permission. A lot of times we think, oh, you can't use it. It's copyright. Well, that's just not true. Just do your due diligence ahead of time and make sure that the owner of that material is okay with whatever you're intending to do with it. You know, I see this broken all the time online. I cannot believe how sloppy we are um, with what we do. And um, I don't think we can study copyright law enough to protect what we have and the rights of others. Okay. Usually the author or creator of the work is the copyright owner. If you have a letter, a personal letter, it belongs to the person who wrote the letter. Just because you own the, you have the document in your possession does not mean you have that copyright. The person who took the picture owns the picture. I love fair use, but it's a tricky one, too. You have to have a little balance with fair use. If you're going to, uh, like, for example, I talked to the General Service Office about this beautiful letter. It's, it, it's, it's a gift to the fellowship. It's about his depression, and it's, and it's almost prescriptive for people who have depression. But we don't have the right to reproduce it. But we could probably take a paragraph or two out of it and share it with someone, that would be fair use. You just can't copy the whole thing without permission. Um, you can't really read this, but there, uh, there are things in the public domain. For example, one, uh, two of Dr. Bob's books that was on his recommended reading list is As a Man Thinketh by J. Mal Allen and The Greatest Thing in the World by Henry Drummond. Those are in public domain. You can, get, you can just Google those and get those. There's a lot of material that is... You could copy yourself, legally. But there's a chart here, which you really can't see, but you can find online that tells you. Like, for example, we have Ann Smith's workbook at Dr. Bob's home. We might like to make that available to you. And in that chart, it tells us 70 years after Ann dies, 
it's now in public domain. So it pays to do some research on public domain. Um, we work in a spirit of cooperation. That's one of our values, which I think AA does pretty well. And I think that this workshop is a wonderful vehicle to, um, to practice that. Um, we share our hope, strength, hope, and experience. Now, this card here reminds me, I was in, um, I was at a big, go for state roundup, actually. And there was a panel of so-called archivists up here, and one of them, none of them had been appointed. None of them had been elected. One of them stood up and said, hey, if you want to be an AA archivist, just go get a card with your name on it and put AA archivist on there. Yeah. That title has been used a lot, but if you follow it down, you may find out that there is no connection at all to our service structure. And I mentioned uh, last night that there are I people and we people. And in this business, that's the first thing I want to know if I meet you. And you're asking for material or whatever you're doing, I'm going to ask, you know, are you a private collector, which is fine. Are you um, an author? Are you connected? You know, what is your background? Are you connected to a district, an area, or an intergroup? Um, those are important questions for me um, so that I understand where you're coming from. And we know through our structure that archivists that use that AA initial come out of the service structure and our groups delegate that responsibility to us. We don't self-appoint ourselves. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the service manual, there's also a little category for a group archivist. I, we've tried to pull our groups together and get our group archivists to get interested in this position, but you, I've never even heard too much being done with that. But it's in our service manual that um, you have an archives group rep. <laughs> How about that? Um, so let's talk a little bit about titles. The first... Uh, archives workshop that we had at the Mayflower Hotel, we tried, one of the things we felt we needed to do that had not been done, these titles were being kind of grouped together and there was a lot of confusion, so we began to take a look at the word collector. That's a person who collects things of a specified type professionally or as a hobby. I'm not here to tell you there's anything wrong with that. I love collectors, they've been very helpful. Um, and certainly this is not in any way, it's only to get these titles cleared up. The next one is a dealer, and that's a person or firm in the business of buying and selling for their own account. So we have people who are calling themselves AA archivists that are doing these things, um, acting also as a collector and a dealer. And I think I mentioned, too, that when we first started out, most of us were book collectors because we, didn't have, we had no um, guidelines. We had nothing. And so some book collectors got into collecting, and, they, and, and, and we didn't have internet, so you wouldn't have known about it. And I even have minutes in our office of one collector who stood up at our intergroup meeting and asked all the old-timers for their big books. Yeah, but, but no one knew. The old-timers didn't know. They gave this fella their big books, and he sold them out the back door. Um, but yeah, and, and that's not uncommon. That's just not uncommon. Obviously, a need for an archives workshop, yes? And we have historians and authors, um, and they're an expert in our history, and they write wonderful books. They're not necessarily an AA archivist. So what is an archivist? A person who has the job of collecting and storing the materials in an archives. An archivist is an information professional who assesses, collects, organizes, preserves, maintains control over, and provides access to records and archives determined to have long-term value. Now let's put the AA in front of some of those terms. That's where I think we really make a distinction. Now you could be a collector of AA material. That would be fine. You could be a historian of AA. But there's also a title called AA Historian. And sometimes your districts and your areas may appoint someone as an AA historian. You're understanding the difference now a little bit in these titles. Um, and then, of course, archivist. AA archivist. For me, I don't know about you, but those terms are special, sig signifying someone working under the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
appointed or elected to service in some delegated area of the structure. Everything we do teaches. So I was at another big conference, and they had two rooms of archives. And they had some of the more elder archivists over here. And I knew one, most of that was private collection, called AA Archives. And in the other room, the new guys had thrown out their possessions. Most of it was not labeled. Somebody had five second editions and put his name on them. And it really upset me. I actually got upset over this and went to the big boys in the other room who weren't real happy with, with what I had to say. But I told them, I said, everything you do teaches. If you're a new archivist and you walk up to, to one of those, dis so, to a display, and it's somebody's personal collection of books, what have you just been taught? And then you th those guys didn't know. They thought that's what it was because they had learned from the other so-called archivists that that's what archives was. So we have a big job to educate people as to what it is and what it isn't. <clears throat> mission statement helps us do that. I hope every one of you has a mission statement for your area or your district because it will help guide you. We're bound by spiritual principles of our fellowship. And now if you look, this is interesting. This is the 12 steps. Isn't that where we all start on our journey with 12 steps? Look at the principles you'll already bring to the table if you're working 12 steps. You're going to have honesty, you're going to have trust, you're going to have willingness, humility, responsibility, accountability, on and on and on. They're already built into our 12 steps, some of the ethical things that go with this job. And of course, we're going to get into the traditions now, and how do we get unity amongst all of us? Let's look to how they apply. It's the opposite of being divided, and if we will surrender to the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, we'll all have unity with each other as to how we're doing this work. I just love this. I just have to throw this cartoon in. This is the cartoon version, but here's all the experience of AA being fed in and coming out the distiller here. So let's look at tradition, tradition one. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon... AA unity. Before the workshop, there was no unity. This is what's so wonderful about all of us gathered under one umbrella here to share our experience, strength, and hope. I think what we'd like to work on next in terms of where we're going with this is to start getting some inventory questions like we have for the traditions, for the concepts, and for the group. I'd like to work on some inventory questions for archivists. Possibly, is our work as a trusted servant, are we serving the common welfare of our area, district, or other appointed or elected position as archivists or members of archives committees? As trusted servants, do we strive for unity in our service to Alcoholics Anonymous? And as an archivist, do our displays reflect the holdings common to the history and welfare of our des delegated area within the scope of our mission statement? I mean, sometimes we get carried away and we're already into BC history, you know, um, and uh, that's where the scope comes in. I've already mentioned the importance of having a mission statement. Bill gives us a mission when he says we're trying to build up extensive records which will be of value to a future historian. It is highly important that the factual material be placed in our files in such a way that there can be no substantial distortion, and we want to keep enlarging on this idea for the sake of the full-length history to come. Today's history. Today is archives. So what are you going to collect? <clears throat> That's an important question to bring. What is the scope? Now, I borrowed some of this from uh, the General Service Office, which has kind of led the way with this. Publications, grapevines, photos, videos, sound recordings, minutes, personal papers, group histories, oral histories. You could add to your own list. Then you have to know how you're going to take in this material. I hope you all know about the deed of gift. Um, we prefer not to take anything on loan. Um, that hasn't proven to have been very good for us. Um, if you have a deed of gift, there's some provisions that you can put into that deed of gift as to how much um, autonomy you have with that gift. Sometimes people give you a gift, and if you don't do what they want you to do with it, they want the gift back. Yeah, yeah I've had that experience a couple times, too. So it's good to have that in the deed of gift. 
Classification, I talked briefly about the four categories, but any collection we accept commits us to the task of organizing and preserving it, which involves hand labor and costs for archival supplies. Hey folks, you don't have to accept everything that people are offering you. It's okay to say no. Sometimes people bought me a first edition big book. We have a first edition big book. We don't need another first edition first printing big book. That big book may be precious to that person's sponsor, and they're really sacrificing to give us that. And we'll just kindly thank them for their generosity and their kindness. We don't have to accept everything that somebody offers us. That's going to depend on your needs, being clear on that, how much space you have, how much time you have, how much money you have to care for it. Donations that require expensive conservation, special housing, intensive processing, or other excessive demands on the archive resources may not be accepted. That may be really helpful to you guys that are starting out. Uh, the GSO Archives does not do monetary appraisals for donors and will not comment on the financial value of any material. Remember, we're, we're a spiritual organization. If you put those two AAs in front of it, this is where we get into trouble with archives. If a monetary appraisal is necessary, it is recommended that such appraisals be done by a disinterested third party before a title to the material is conveyed to the GSO Archives. And I'm sure the GSO Archives doesn't care if you borrow some of their policies for your archives. Visit their website. There's a lot of good information on there. In cases where the collection would be a better fit in a different archives collection, the GSO Archives will work with the donor to place it in the appropriate repository. And I've mentioned that to you, too, that we will give you things that don't belong to our area. Uh, actually, Area 54 um, and the Akron Archives have a wonderful spirit of cooperation. When I see something that needs to go into Area 54, I give it to Bob. He puts it into the archives. If he sees something more pertinent to ours, and actually, Dr. Bob's home and the archives now have a nice relationship where when they have something that actually belongs to the story in Dr. Bob's house, they share that with us. And if we get something in there that really is appropriately in the scope of that collection, we do that. That's the spirit of cooperation. Um, some of the things the GSO does not collect are data, raw data, drafts, incomplete documents, three-dimensional artifacts such as artwork, t-shirts, mugs, jewelry, and multiple copies of any one item. Y'all familiar with this? This is our big book, isn't it? This is the archives big book. <laughs> Everything you need to know is actually in there. Um, I'm just going to skip that. Um, the archives of the General Service Office generally does not seek to acquire collections with a focus on local groups, district, or areas, but they do accept area histories. We work in the best interests of our area. And you know what? Important line. Sometimes we get a little carried away. We want to have the best archives. We get interested in all kinds of things as archivists. But I think we need to remember that we're responsible uh, to those we serve. And I think an important question is, who are you serving? If you can keep that in mind, you can stay on track. A archivists understand that their efforts support the primary purpose of AA by preserving the shared experience of generations of AA members. Tradition two. Now, this is obviously the group conscience, right? And where we get into trouble sometimes, unfortunately, there's one-man committees. Sometimes an archivist doesn't even have a committee. So how are you going to have a consciousness without a committee? The committee is the spiritual entity. I remember when I started out, I didn't have much of a committee either, so I gathered all the old-timers together, and they were my originally first committee to guide me. Um, and I, I, I want that voice of God to speak to me when I'm doing work for AA. We recognize that whoever retains our history directs our future and understand their role in contributing to the informal group conscience of their area. Uh, providing access. I like this. In our service to our delegated position and the decisions we make for the common welfare derived from the group conscience of the archives. I'm sorry, I read that, didn't read it as a question. Let me read that again. Is our service to our delegated position and the decisions we make for the common welfare derived from the group conscience of the Archives Committee? Do we rely on God as he chooses to express himself in our group conscience and the three legacies of service 
to govern our archival decisions. And then I came up with this word. I don't know, remember now where I found it, but Godfidence. Do you like that? Is that a confidence? That's our Godfidence. Tradition three, the only requirement for AA membership is desire to stop drinking. That doesn't really play out a whole lot, so I'm going to go to four. Each group should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. How does our service to our delegated position affect AA as a whole? Are we in unity with other AA principles of service and the guidelines governing AA archives? Five, how about carrying the message, huh? And I'm going to show you what I mean by this is what we do. I remember when they said, Gail, we don't need an archives here in Akron. We're just supposed to answer the phones and carry the message. I said, the archives is the message. We're carrying it from one generation to another. And how we do that um, is what we're going to talk about now. In all its actions, the archives committee needs to be guided by AA's primary purpose. Um, we're just to collect and preserve the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. What message does our archives display carry? Does it carry the message of AA for the alcoholic who still suffers? Are our displays well labeled and organized so that they teach? Does it reflect the history of our delegated area of responsibilities and what is the purpose of the items we choose to display for the fellowship? All right, so there's an example of a display. Now pretend for just a minute you're the new guy. You're, the, you're, you're, you're new to AA. You've got six months sobriety, and you just walked into an archives exhibit area. What would you learn from that? I mean, that's... You'll see this often in archives displays. Now, if that was a little more well-labeled, or if some, because all those are shiny books with covers, right? Even the archivists don't read these, Okay. And so I, I, I've been talking a lot more about display. And if you walk into the archive display room, I believe that room does teach quite a bit. And um, I compliment those that have brought their displays uh, this weekend. It's as spiritual in there as it is at a workshop, actually. It's fabulous in there. Again, here's some books, different languages. What does, I mean, yeah, that might say we have, we have big books published in other languages, but for that space on that table, I wonder what the new guy's going to get out of that. <clears throat> Now I offer you that. Not a lot of stuff. Not a lot of artifacts involved in that display, but I'll tell you what, if you were to read these, and uh, Arthur S. designed them, and he makes that available for anybody starting out, I believe display is some of the best archives work you can do because it tells a story and it carries a message. That's a little closer up, a little blurry, sorry about that, but you can kind of get an idea of what you can do with a limited amount of space for archives. It doesn't have to be stuff. Again, when I started out, I thought, I can't be an archivist. I don't have a big red. I don't have a first edition, first printing big book. Today, I know that is the least thing I needed to worry about. I started out, this was my first display I ever put up, put it up at King's School for the 50th anniversary when they area still did not want archives. I had to tear this display away from you for Founders Day the first year, just the display. And these pictures are all available at our office. Tradition six, here's where we get into a lot of trouble uh, and have in the past with our trustees. Here's where, what? Problems of money, property, and prestige. Is your collection considered property? Are you dealing with money at all? How about prestige? Look what I have. Look what we have. Little ego gets, sneaks in there every now and then. Can divert us from our primary spiritual aim. Aren't we here to help the still-suffering alcoholic? And should not our displays be, we be thinking about the still-suffering alcoholic and passing this on? We should never go into business. Whoops. I'll go back here to anonymity, which is another really tough one. We, we, are, we have all those archival values and codes and all that I explained in the beginning, and we have an additional set of things to try and follow, steps, traditions, and concepts. So we're really, we're really challenged with a lot of principles, aren't we? It is important to ensure the privacy and protect the anonymity of members whose names are included in the collected documents. 
You know, you have to know LL from LL. That's not easy. Experience has shown that it's best that AA archivists not collect AA material personally. That's not to say that we don't. We don't want to condemn anybody. We're just saying that it's preferred that we not try to do both together. The GSO archive generally does not purchase archival records, books, or artifacts, and does not accept items on loan. Do problems of money, property, and prestige in our archives divert us from our primary purpose? Are we mixing property with spirituality when we bring private property for display? I think Bill told us that's only supposed to mix in the basket. Does it apply? These are just questions for us to think about and hopefully develop for the future. Seven, self-supporting, declining outside contributions. I can only speak from my experience where they said I was supposed to be self-supporting even after they asked me to do it through my own contributions. It took us a while to get this, and I was really glad when our guidelines came out. And they stated that we should be fully funded according to the spirit of the seventh tradition. Know your literature so that if you do get challenged, you can actually speak from the language of we and not the language of I. The operational budget for equipment, office supplies, duplicating services, taping, and other needs should be part of the area district overall budget. This way, the archival service enjoys the support of the full membership and keeps the perspective as a valued part of 12-step activity. Is our archives collection fully self-supporting, and do we decline outside contributions? Wouldn't it, I would have loved to have been able to write a grant. But as an AA entity, now when I do work now, for, I'm on the board of Dr. Bob's home currently, we can write grants. There's a big difference. And a lot of people thought a, that Dr. Bob's house is AA. It's not. We can't own property. Um, so it's been interesting. Thank God Nell was my teacher because Nell showed me the difference between the a foundation and between AA and how it operates both with mission statements. Eight, we should remain non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. That one doesn't really apply. But this tradition nine does. Rotating leadership is the best, but for us, you know, you've come to this. Your, your area or district has sent you here to get training. You're going to get experience. Guess what? It doesn't rotate real well. So, it's recommended that archivists not ra rotate as often as other positions in Alcoholics Anonymous. For that, we're just a little different that way. And we should be directly responsible, again, to, I think this statement is so important, that we keep an eye on who we're serving and not become self-serving. All right, is the shared experience not to rotate frequently since it takes a considerable length of time to get familiar with the material? So that's the question I love there, okay. 10, uh, we have no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. You know, as archivists, you sometimes, like I've been involved in, uh, oh, this is really weird, especially with anonymity, the opening of the Gate Lodge, I was invited to that, and there was a lot of filming going on, and of course, I'm not speaking on my alcoholism, so I took it to my committee, should I use my last name or not? As soon as I say Gail L., I'm really looking, you're really looking at a alcoholic. I'm, might as well say I'm alcoholic. If I had used my full name, no one would have known. They'd know, is she or isn't she? They wouldn't know. I chose to err on the side of caution because our fellowship doesn't even understand that tradition that well. And you as archivists, I'm just sort of passing that on to you um, in terms of uh, that. Um, I did a radio show too, uh, BBC or something, and I remember talking. One desk at GSO told me to use my last name, and the other desk told me not to. <laughs> so... Um, Again, I'm not talking about my alcoholism, and you, we do have non-alcoholic archivists. So uh, I'll leave it up to your group and your group conscience on that. Um, but you could get drawn into public controversy. When we, the first time we sold the manuscript, the New York Times called me up, and they wanted a statement on that from me. Now, I declined making a statement. Um, you have to watch the press sometimes. They can twist things around and put you in there in a way you don't want to be. So... Um, be careful as a historian or archivist that you don't get drawn into that. So AA archivists should never express views or opinions on outside issues, assuring that AA is not drawn into public controversy. You are servants of your area and your committee. 
So are we careful to stay principled in our service in conducting archives activities and publications so as not to violate the rights or copyrights of other entities? Are our decisions in the handling of the material in our care ethical? And are we following archival ethics and guidelines as suggested in our workbook? You know, a lot of archivists like to publish. We take personal letters and we throw it in there. We're not, we're, and, and just recently our office got a hold of a book that had been published and we thought it'd be a really good idea to publish that. But we weren't, we didn't do our due diligence on anonymity on copyright, on getting permission, and we had to shred quite a few books because our board decided that we would no longer make that book accessible. Um, so even with all our training, we make mistakes too. So I can't tell you enough to be careful in publishing that, that you know what you're doing. Um, a lot of times we self-publish and we think that author uh, know, has published and done that work and then we reproduce it and it, it was not correct. Eleven, um, we're based on attraction rather than promotion, personal anonymity. I've talked a little bit about my experience with that at the level of press, radio, and films. Uh, you know we got that from Hemsley and Bill. And um, anonymity also, I don't know if you know this or not, but our conference advisory actions, I, last time I counted it was seven times, has voted that we care for posthumous anonymity. Am I over time? I'm good? Okay. Okay, so did you know that? Because about 90% of our fellowship doesn't know that. All right. We think that after, it, let's say you die, and I want to put your picture up, okay? Even though you died, I should keep your anonymity. Your family may not like your picture up on the wall in our archives. So the conference where our delegates go every year comes out with advisory uh, decisions, and they've asked us repeatedly to keep posthumous anonymity. Did you guys all know that? No. no. Well, I got some hard lessons when I met Frank Mauser on that and several others, so, so it's good to pass that on. Most of our fellowship doesn't know that. I think you'll, you'll see good examples at the General Service Office. They're pretty good about practicing that, so keep that in mind um, when you're publishing pictures online and things like that. Uh, development of procedures seem to be a matter of local policy, decisions by the Archives Committee, but the necessity for protecting the confidentiality of correspondence and the anonymity of the correspondence is without question an important consideration and a trust that falls upon all AA archivists and Archives Committees. You know, some of those letters that you have, those were personal letters. They were never meant for the Internet. They were, they, they were personal letters written from someone to someone, and we sort of exploit that. There's where your ethics come in. Um, it's important to remember that many of the letters we shared are individual opinions and not with the intention of making them public. Those letters were never intended to be public. Um, you might want to have some signs. Are you going to let people take pictures of your exhibit? What do you have on exhibit? Uh, archival displays at A events might also include signs about anonymity throughout the exhibit area and discourage picture taking of certain items. Are we careful to protect our anonymity as an AA member when speaking publicly at the level of press, radio, and film? And are we careful to protect the posthumous anonymity, which I just spoke about? Twelve. Okay, so anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Uh, one of the ways I do this, and the slide's going to come up after this, but I'm going to talk about it here. When I think of the 12th tradition, I think of giving credit back to God. I think of our co-founders. I think of our early pioneers. And they were always getting us to focus on the higher power, not on them. And many times as archivists, we want to make them heroes, or we want to build them up. And they ask us not to do it. At Founders Day, I see people come and get in line at Founders Day, and they got a picture of Bob here on the T-shirt, picture here of Bill, and in the middle of Sister Ignatia. And I thought, boy, that's the last thing those three people wanted, is a uniform of themselves. <laughs> um, so when I get to this 12th tradition, I try to do archives work humili with humility for them. I try to keep that sense of humility that they tried to pass on to us 
and incorporate that into the story. And for those of you that come tomorrow to the story where I interview Bill Wilson, I think at the very end you will see whose story it really is. So, do we apply the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous contained in the three legacies to our delegated archival service? And do we put our trust in God and AA in all our archival affairs? I just mentioned this. These were ordinary men <clears throat> in extraordinary circumstances. This is God's story. And that's what the 12th tradition means to me. Let's not forget when we talk about and we tell this story uh, who the real author is. I have a few minutes left, so I'd like to bring in concepts. How many minutes do I have? Are you keeping track? Getting close, isn't it? I can do it. Because I'm not going to do all 12. But I'm going to tell you, if you're in service to Alcoholics Anonymous, this is your Bill of Rights. I didn't know these when I started out, and it can be kind of brutal. I like to talk from the language of we, not the language of I. And if you bring in this language into your committee meetings and stuff, you not only teach, but, but when you'll be applying them. So um, the collective conscience. These were pretty much designed to protect the voice, your voice, hopefully, as an archivist. God's voice, hopefully. Because it, they really match up with tradition, too. <clears throat> Some traditional and practical... Whoop, whoop, whoop. Getting back there. Oh, that's the balance. This is the two words that will keep coming up. You saw the word authority there. The traditions, therefore, some traditional and practical principle has to be devised, which at all levels will continually balance the right relation between authority and responsibility. You're going to be given responsibility, a lot of responsibility. Remember all those roles of an archivist? You have to be given the authority to do that. When I started out, they didn't really know what archives was, so they gave me the responsibility, but they didn't give me a lot of authority. They pretty much tried to micromanage me, and of course it doesn't work. But um, we had to learn these the hard way as I brought them one at a time to the boardroom table. Um, and they really work. But these two words balance all our service commitments over and over again. The archivist, and how that works is you have some responsibility to report regularly to the area committee, if it exists, the Area Archives Committee, about new material received and to give updates about ongoing projects at the archives. In other words, you need to be transparent with the people that you serve. Some of the concepts have to do with the right of decision, the right of participation, and the right of appeal. I love concept nine. I used to be afraid of it because I thought leadership meant control. I've even heard it said uh, in the first workshop that the person was afraid to lead because it looked like control. And I was too. Today I really respect the, the concept nine. Concept nine is leadership. And Bill wrote the most beautiful essays you ever want to read on leadership. If you have not read concept nine, um, I really hope that you read some of the beautiful things. Sometimes you have to stand alone. Sometimes you have to stand flat-footed. Sometimes there might be a principle that you might have to practice um, because some of these archives principles, most of the people don't know. And you may have to stand alone as an archivist because uh, they haven't, you know, they it's hard when other people want to govern you and they haven't even read the material having to do with archives. They haven't read the workbook. They haven't read it. And you can't serve two masters. Um, I've been in that position where people who were trying to govern us didn't even know what we were doing, which we'll get into our warranties here in a minute. So... No matter how well we design that structure, uh, good leadership, uh, I'm sorry about that, uh, the, uh, principles and relationships, no matter how well we apportion uh, authority and responsibility, the operating results of our structure can be no better than the personal performance of those who must man it and make it work. So I hope you and your committee develop the policies, the procedures that are needed so that you have a good structure to work in. Good leadership cannot function well in a poorly designed structure. All right, so I'm just going to move into concept 12. I'm not going to read the whole one because it breaks down beautifully. Warranty one, observe the spirit of AA tradition taking care that it never becomes the seat of perilous wealth or power. Could that happen with an archives? Even could a, could a district have an ego? An area have an ego?
Warranty two, that your archives <coughs> shall take care that sufficient operating funds plus an ample reserve be its prudent financial principle. You might have to mention where this comes from. A lot of times we argue over, the, the, uh, over this principle and no one knows that it's in concept 12 and it's warranty two. Bring that to the table. You got a little support that way. Warranty three, that it placed none of its members in a position of unqualified authority over others. I have been in that position when I started out. I don't think I would have minded if the people trying to tell me what to do knew anything about archives. If they were qualified, I would have welcomed it. But when they tried to make it into a business and they, you know, we don't even insure our archives because it's spiritual property. Um, but they were trying to... Uh, Oh, they wanted access. There was all kinds of things going on. I called New York a lot to get their experience. But you have to watch this. Uh, that it reached all important decisions by discussion, vote, and whenever possible by substantial unanimity. Try to keep working. If you're making a vote, try not to split the group with like a 51% say yes and a 49% say no. What happens to the group? It splits. You lose your spirit. You lose the spirit of the group. I know because when they voted archives in, it was 51%, 49% didn't know what it was, and um, that wasn't a fun way to enter that. I would have rather they waited, tabled it, till they got a little more of consent. How about this one? <laughs> that its actions never be personally punitive nor an incitement to public controversy. This one's being talked about a lot lately. Um, you might know that we're kind of in the news right now. And what I like about that is when we look at these concepts, we can start to learn them through. Uh, sometimes when things go wrong in AA, you can learn the principles that way. When you see something going wrong, go look at your principles and see if you can find which one isn't working. And the warranty six, that it never perform acts of government and that like the society it serves, it will always remain democratic in thought and action. Do you remember when the code talked about being democratic? Well, these concepts are about being democratic in thought and action too, whatever that means to you. Um, that often comes across my mind. Are we being democratic in thought and action? So Bill closes with these and he says, freedom under God to grow in his likeness and image will ever be the quest of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I'll just leave you with this. Our job is to pass it on. Thank you so much for coming today. I hope you can apply these in your service. Thank you very much, Gail. That was excellent. Uh, would you, since we're running short of time, would you uh, please help me close with the responsibility pledge? <laughs> 